Hello, friends. Symbiotic relationships are often encountered in nature. Sometimes we can observe them with the naked eye. For instances, the absolute interdependence between bees and flowering plants. However, sometimes we need special equipment, such as a microscope, to observe a symbiosis. Many animals do indeed exhibit strange symbiotic relationships. In layman's terms, symbiosis is a mutually beneficial relationship, including physical contact between two organisms which do not belong to the same species. These relationships provide for cleanliness, defense, transportation, and sometimes even the search for sustenance. In today's video, I will tell you about several amazing and strange examples of such symbiosis. When coyotes and badgers work together, they combine their specific hunting skills to increase the odds of catching the prey. Yes, you heard me right, folks. Coyotes and badgers hunt together. The larger coyote chases its prey across prairies and meadows, while the badger hides in the burrow of the prey, such as the gopher or the prairie dog, in order to grab it when it returns home. This way, the coyote gets its prey as it tries to escape the burrow, while the badger attacks the prey as it tries to hide underground. Despite the fact that only one predator ends up with the trophy, the research shows that the combined efforts of these animals increases the chances of getting food for both of them. Badgers and coyotes have the same diet, and therefore, they compete for food. However, the cunning prairie dogs aren't easy to catch, as they rarely stray far from their burrows. So, the mighty Badger-Coyote Alliance actually helps both animals improve their odds when hunting the prairie dogs. Some coyotes band into free communities, but the majority of them lead a solitary lifestyle, as they rarely hunt in packs. Interestingly, a badger is even more of a loner than a coyote is, which makes their partnership even stranger. The research demonstrates that those coyotes who cooperate with badgers catch about one-third more prey than those coyotes who prefer to hunt on their own. Carnivorous Plants and the Bat Feces Carnivorous plants devour and digest living organisms that end up caught in their traps. Carnivorous plants have evolved to consume this type of food owing to a lack of nitrogen. Similarly to how a Myomricodia attracts ants to use their nitrogen-saturated waste products, the predatory carnivorous plant usually lures in insects and small animals. In this case, however, the plant doesn't offer shelter to its guests, but rather consumes them instead. Nevertheless, there is a type of carnivorous plant species that is very hospitable. Nepenthes hemsleyana is an unusually large plant of this type, which learn to coexist with bats. During the day, Vespertilianidae bats of the Caravula hardwickii kind enter the plant and rest there until nightfall. Contrary to expectations, the plant doesn't digest their guests, but are actually happy to shelter the bats to recycle their feces later. There's a reason why bats choose this specific plant out of the rainforest-rich canopy. This carnivorous plant has its special ways to attract the bats. The backside of the Nepenthes flower is saucer-shaped and can reflect the signals emanating from the bat who's searching for shelter. Thus, the echolocation leads the bat straight to the giant flower, and both sides benefit from this partnership. Fig Tree and Wasps If you ever saw a fig tree, or if you like figs, you're probably aware of the fact that wasps love this plant too, as their bodies can often be discovered inside the figs. The relationship between these insects and fig trees started 60 million years ago at the very least, so it's not like the wasps get in our way of enjoying figs, but on the contrary, we are the invaders of their comfort zone. By the way, a fig is not exactly a fruit, but rather a hollow, rounded structure composed of a multitude of flowers. As the fig matures, 
It emits a smell that attracts the pregnant wasps from the family Chalcidoidae. The insect must literally burrow its way inside the fig. This is actually harder than it sounds, and the wasp often ends up tearing its tentacles and wings in the process. As soon as the wasp gets inside, it lays eggs there and also brings in pollen from other fig trees. Once the mission is accomplished, the wasp dies. If a fig tree doesn't get pollinated, it hibernates and ultimately dies, together with the wasp eggs. This is a cruel way that evolution has designed to ensure that wasps pollinate fig trees as the lives of all wasp eggs depend on it. If pollination does happen, then the fig eventually splits and a new generation of wasps hatches. At first, they feed on the fig pulp. Both male and female wasps grow inside the figs. Male wasps collect the pollen for female wasps and dig their way out of the fig. Males succeed in bringing pollen from the other plants before female wasps break free and go out in search of a new fig tree to lay their eggs in. Thanks to this cycle, both plants and insects continue to thrive. Gobi Fish and Pistol Shrimp Gobi Fish and Pistol Shrimp are best pals on the ocean floor. Almost like roommates, these two different creatures have a clear-cut and clean symbiotic relationship. Pistol Shrimp don't object to sharing its home with Gobi Fish. As the former builds a home for them on the sea floor, the latter observes the environment defending both the burrow and the Pistol Shrimp. The Gobi Fish has excellent eyesight and can easily spot an enemy, giving an advanced warning to the Pistol Shrimp. Thus, these two creatures share a mini-cave under the sea and help each other out. Since Pistol Shrimp are mostly blind, they let the Gobi Fish know when they are about to leave their home in search of food. Then, as they move, the Pistol Shrimp touch the Gobi Fish with their antennas continuously maintaining contact. Pistol Shrimp populate shallow seabeds, and it is important for them to maintain symbiotic relationships with the Gobi Fish. It has been noted that the Gobi fish even collect seaweed and other food for their roommates. They can bring seaweed to the burrow's entrance so that the blind pistol shrimp can easily find it. If the Gobi fish see danger lurking around, they snap their tails as a sign of warning. In exchange for protection, the pistol shrimp provide their guards with shelter. The Gobi fish also use the burrow's safety to seduce its partner with a special ritual which lasts for quite some time. Astonishingly, over 100 types of goby fish maintain symbiotic relationships with pistol shrimp. The Warthog and Mongoose Once upon a time, Ugandan scientists witnessed a strange friendship between warthogs and mongooses. The scientists of the Ugandan Queen Elizabeth National Park Notice that warthogs lie down on the ground once they come across a mongoose. Thus, warthogs are treated to a fastidious cleanup as sharp-toothed mongooses collect insects and especially mites off their skin. So a mongoose eats while a warthog gets some thorough cleaning. Often, a group of mongooses clean the warthog's rough skin together, with some of them even mounting the pig. The African Starling African Starlings spend a great deal of their time sitting on elephants, rhinos, zebras, and African buffaloes where they eat mites, picking them off their host skin. This diet provides the African Starlings with all the nutrients they need. Besides, big animals are elated that the birds free them from the parasites and mites. Scientists believe that this relationship started a very long time ago as it seems that the starling's beak was created exactly for the purpose of deep penetration into the animal's skin to search for food there. However, the relationship between African starlings and their host animals aren't always mutually beneficial. 
When starlings remove the pest from the animal's skin, they also suck some blood from the open wounds. That's another way to obtain nutrients for them, but it also makes the birds into parasites. This practice might lead to infection of the host animal, blurring the symbiotic nature of the relationship between the birds and their host animal. The starlings aren't always efficient either. Sometimes they ignore mites if they aren't filled with blood, which is the main nutritional component for birds. In this case, starlings let the mites feast upon their host skin until they're filled with blood which makes them more attractive to the birds. Friends, that's all for today. Please like the video and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.